Welcome to the Bio Balance HealthCast, episode number 411. Why most doctors get thyroid treatment wrong. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Kathy and I both have hypothyroid. And we talk, both take medicines for it. The reason that matters to me is I get a prescription for my thyroid medicine from Dr. Maupin. I don't run it through my insurance. My insurance company doesn't pay for it. But when she first started prescribing it for me based on the symptoms that I had, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. And your lab work. And my lab work. And the blood tests that come back, which we'll also describe. She got a letter from my insurance company who doesn't, as far as any of my records and interactions with them, doesn't know that she exists. <laughs> but they sent her a letter and they said, we understand that you're prescribing Armour Thyroid for this person, me. And we wonder if you are unaware that that is not the standard of care for elderly gentlemen. And so she showed me the letter and said, what do you want me to do about this? Because they've written me and I feel like I need mm -hmm. to make a response. And I said, write them and tell them to go to hell because they don't have any business talking to you about my interactions with you because I'm not asking them to pay for any of my interactions with you. Right. It's none of their business and they shouldn't have even known about it. I don't know how they know, knew about it. It's where HIPAA fails to protect our, our privacy is with insurance companies because insurance companies know everything. But they shouldn't have an opinion about that. And and honestly, I'm not sure about the standard of care well, issue. Well, I, I don't know which I was over wrought about most, the standard of care or issue. Or the elderly man. Or the elderly gentleman <laughs> issue. I mean, if you No always, one's called me a gentleman and I don't know how long. But if you've always taken thyroid, just, I've taken thyroid, I've a very forward thinking DO doctor in Kansas City put me on thyroid when I was 21 and I absolutely- DO, Dr. Uh, DO, Dr. of Osteopathy. DOs and MDs are trained alike, but DOs have much more of the preventive medicine, uh, nutritional background. So this woman put me on thyroid medicine when I was 21 and I desperately needed it, both by basal body temperature, uh -huh. which we'll talk about, and my blood work and all my symptoms. So I, I've been on it. And what happens, so, so all of a sudden, your thyroid never works again. So all of a sudden you hit 65 or 70 and you don't take thyroid anymore? Is that is that the standard of care that we just let everybody get slow and 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 fat and I mean, and swell up and and not and make their cholesterol go up. I mean, what is that? Why would that be standard of care? Well, yes, it, it makes so, no so, sense. So you have ongoing issues with uh -huh. the way mainstream medicine functions, uh -huh. which is why you're uh, you've removed yourself from uh -huh. the label mainstream medicine. You're you're no longer a practicing. Uh, OBGYN, mm -hmm. although you still have all your credits, that's not what you do for mm -hmm. a living. You now do m sort of a new age medicine that's, that looks at, and there are a lot of different names for it out in the marketplace, mm -hmm. and anti-aging medicine is one mm -hmm. of those. You look at what can we learn and what can we do to help people who are getting older get older in the most healthy way and have the most functional of lives for the duration of whatever their lifespan with is. With the least illness. Yes, with the least illness. And so that is your focus, mm -hmm. and you study the research and you keep up with it. Uh, and one of the things that you have found in your research is that where you live in Missouri mm -hmm. is in the middle of the Midwest, and that the Midwest is a, a goiter. The goiter belt. The goiter the belt. The goiter belt in the U.S. is where there was no ocean in the recent millennial millenniums uh, to lay down kelp, which lay, laid down iodine. So iodine is what our thyroid 
hormone is made out of. So it is, it's an amino acid, like part of a protein in the center of the molecule. Not that you need to know this, but this is why you need iodine. And then it has one, two, three, or four iodines around it. So if you don't have enough iodine, you can't make your thyroid. Each of those four iodines is marginally different. They, they each have their own chemical makeup, amino acids, and so on. No, the amino acid's in the center. Okay. That's a protein. And then iodine is a mineral, and it, it, it goes around the center. So either you have one of them or two of them or three of them or four. So it's T3, T1 or T4. T for thyroid. T for thyroid. And they all do different things? Yes. The horm- the, yes, those hormones do different things. And t- so they all four really need to work. Right. And, and if you, you don't have, have all four. one, two, or three of them working, mm-hmm. then you're, you have hypothyroidism. Right. Which means low because low. the four elements are not, you don't have four elements. You have one or none. Or, mm-hmm. or, an, or you can't make the molecule because you don't have enough iodine. Or your thyroid uh, gland that's in your neck here, sits right on top of your collarbone, is, is not working. So it can't, ma- even if you had plenty of iodine, it can't make enough thyroid for your body. So, so I used to see that when I was a child in Arkansas mm-hmm. growing up, that I would run into people that have this big bulge swelling Here. in their neck. Mm-hmm. And as a child, I'd say, oh, my gosh, what is that? And my parents would say, it's a goiter. Mm-hmm. It is a goiter. And so that's that's what happens when this little gland that's usually flat, and your neck is usually flat, when it's struggling, when it's trying to make the hormone that you need, and your brain, your pituitary, is sending a message to the thyroid with TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, it's it's pushing the thyroid. It gets bigger as it's trying to push and make more thyroid. So it's, it's like trying to uh, prime a motor that's out of gas, and you put a little bit of gas mm-hmm. in the carburetor. So when, when the pituitary gland sends that message to the thyroid, it says, make some more. It's more like the gas pedal. And yeah, it's so it's trying to make some more, but it can't make it? Right. It can't make it, so it's struggling to make it so it grows. Okay. So you can see it, and I see it a lot. In St. Louis and Kansas City, I mean, when you're just out, well, not in my pa- patient population, I hope, but in uh, when I'm just out socially, all I those see elderly that. gentlemen that you treat. No, they're every age. I mean, this hits every age, and and there for it's a much more common uh, illness in women because when we grow up and when we're in puberty, we get breasts, and when we get breasts, the breasts need iodine. So the iodine. If it's in short supply that used to supply your thyroid, get shunted to your breasts. So there's a hierarchy of needs, mm-hmm. and a woman's body says the greater need is to put the thyroid in the breasts. Mm-hmm. To put the iodine in the breasts. I'm sorry. So, yes, so the, so the building block of this hormone is now going to the breast, and the thyroid's struggling, and so then you you get a goiter, or you just get all the symptoms of low thyroid, which is. But, but we'll go through most the list. people when they grow up, most women when mm-hmm. they grow up have enough that they can do both. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Especially if they don't live in this Midwestern area or um, if, they, if they're if they on the ocean, mm-hmm. there's plenty of iodine there from kelp and there's plenty of iodine in in the areas of the United States that were once underwater but uh, and had kelp growing. So, so, so how does... Kelp makes iodine. Fluoridation in the water impact. This. Okay, so not only <laughs> not only do we have a problem with not having enough iodine in our groundwater and our and our soil, but we we put things in our water that poison us, and and fluoride is one of them. Yeah, great, we don't have cavities, but it it basically is a stronger um, chemical, and it it shoves the iodine out of your body and it takes fluoride and it puts fluoride in your body instead of the iodine. So it's getting rid of your iodine. So that's a bad thing. In the 1950s, late late 40s, early 50s, a lot of cities uh, decided to put fluorine in the water Mm -hmm. because it would help children prevent cavities. Right. And And it did that. And it did that. It was successful. What it also did was impact the amount of iodine that you were consuming. Well, you could con- you could consume it, but it basically would the fluoride in your body would get rid of the iodine, 
And, and it, it counteracts it? It yes. like dissolves it or something? It takes its place on your receptor sites. Okay. And it also... It's a bully. It crowds it out of the way. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you don't have any iodine in your water, you would think, well, I'm going to put fluoride on there. in there, so what? There's no iodine there anyway yeah. for it to take the place of. But then when it gets in your body, it hooks up to all the receptor sites for iodine. And so then even then your thyroid can't hook up to a cell and turn the cell on. Hmm. So that's scary. And then there's another chemical in the environment that took the place of iodine in the things we eat. So we used to add iodine to salt. We used to add iodine to bread. We used to add iodine to flour and all baked goods because that was one way of getting iodine to people who didn't get it in their diet. So that was great. You know, we, here we're, we're kind of balancing it. We put fluoride in our water. We're kicking out the iodine and blocking the thyroid, but we're adding iodine to our baked goods. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, and I'm not sure why, in the 70s, we, and maybe late 70s, we got rid of the iodine in all of those foods and didn't supplement it anymore. And we put bromine, which is actually a toxin, into our foods. So we have bromine that it helps dough becomes, make it easier to knead, you know, to make it into bread. And so we use that, and that also attack, attaches to the same receptors iodine normally would and blocks your thyroid. So not only we, do we often not have enough thyroid and enough iodine, we have these other things that the government hasn't banned, hmm. which I, I mean, honestly, if you want fluoride... Put it in your toothpaste and spit it out. Don't swallow it, you know, and then take it out of our water. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that's really creating a problem. So it's I see so many women I with remember, iodine I remember growing up problems. in central Arkansas in the 50s and 60s, and we were reading in, in high school and college, we were reading articles in magazines mm -hmm. that were debating the legitimacy of putting mm -hmm. fluoride in the water mm -hmm. and and. and Part and of they the knew they knew about the fact that it would that it would compete with the iodine in our bodies. I, they knew that then. Yeah, yeah, but they're they just the the arguments that I saw were okay. So, how city water going to be different from country water? And country water is going to be healthier. <laughs> maybe so, but they to protect us from whatever and cavities being one of the things they were mm -hmm. protecting us from. They put fluorine in the water. Yeah, I, I really kind of wonder about what we, there's not much we can do about that unless we know people who, in the government, but that's what happens when people in the government are are acting as scientists or doctors and making those yeah. decisions. Those decisions should have been made by people who had the good of human the human body in mind. So, that's those are those are things that are inhibiting our ability right now without medicine or doctors being involved, and they cause a huge number of low thyroid patients. The next step is, so you, so you have <coughs> symptoms of low thyroidism. So that would be weight gain, swelling, fatigue, depression, things that we use other drugs for. Um, the uh, loss of hair all over, loss of your lateral eyebrows, the outside of your eyebrows. Um, when you look at somebody and they've got broken ends everywhere, their nails are brittle and, and they have ridges all over them. So that's why the doctors look at your yeah. nails when you go for your yearly exam. Mm -hmm. They turn them in different lights to see the. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they how, how should. How many lines are and on And then them. you put stuff like this on them and you can't tell. Well, I don't. <laughs> then we have to <laughs> take off the nail polish. Yeah, so they can check it out. Right. So um, if you're feeling cold all the time when everybody else is comfortable, if your hands and feet are cold all the time, oftentimes that's low, low thyroid. Get this, constipation. How many things do you see on television about constipation? Constipation is a sign of low thyroid. I mean, we treat it with all these other things, but if we, when I treat thyroid, constipation gets better. People aren't constipated anymore. So, so they've created a, a whole market system for treating individual symptoms. There are thousands of drugs for each, of, I mean, for all of these symptoms. Yeah. Instead of just using one thyroid. Oh, well, there might be more than one cause. I mean, being, yeah, having cold be. hands and feet could mm -hmm. be Renault's disease. Or it could be thyroid. Uh, 
poor low thyroid or poor circulation, but in general, in general, if your yeah. hands and feet are cold, it could be Raynaud's, Raynaud's or low thyroid, not low circulation, because usually it doesn't affect your hands. So that you also have low pulse and low blood pressure. So when people come in and go, oh yeah, my blood pressure, my blood pressure is always low, my pulse is sixty, and they're not athletes. That's a sign that they have low Predominantly thyroid. women. Predominantly women. Men have it, but mm-hmm. not at the same statistical level. Right. It's a women's disease. And, and that's another problem because women's diseases in the past have always been kind of, kind of just brushed under the rug. Mm-hmm. And we, do, we don't have any say in it. But there's, doctors are taught that they can look at one blood test, TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, the hormone that goes from your brain to your thyroid, and make a decision on whether you have low thyroid, whether you need medication, and after you have medication, whether that medication is working. But TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, is not always representative of how your thyroid's working. You need to look at the T3 and the T4, the two most so effective when you just look at TSH, hormones. that comes out of the pituitary gland. Right. And so they're not looking at the thyroid at all no. to see how well it's handling what it gets from the pituitary. Right. And then they're making, based on that one piece of data, mm-hmm. a decision about how your thyroid is working. And they're right. not looking at your symptoms. That's right. And they're looking at what the lab tests tell them is normal. For that one hormone. For that one hormone. But right. normal was measured by tests on men because they never allowed mm-hmm. women to be tested for any of these things, mm-hmm. because women could get pregnant, it could screw up pregnancy, yeah, it could potentially. Up the test. So all the norms that we've operated on for years on on lab sheets, like from Quest, mm-hmm. uh, are based on tests on men, mm-hmm. and men typically don't get thyroid disease. That's true. Men don't. So, except as we age, we get men get thyroid disease. But, but, but we create a perfect storm then. Right. We we don't test the right thing. We don't mm-hmm. test it in the right amount, and we don't test the right sex, and we don't have the right norms. And we don't listen to symptoms. So I have I have a lot. So so this comes from so many patients coming in and saying, "Well, my endocrinologist or my primary care looked at my TSH and said I don't have low thyroid." When they have every symptom of low thyroid, and their T3 and their T4, the two most important thyroid hormones, are low, and they have low thyroid, but just because they looked at the TSH, and the TSH is based on men and not women, then they they would have been okay for a guy, but they're not okay for a woman because the highest TSH you should have as a woman is 2.5, and for men is 4.5. So TSH goes up as thyroid gets lower. It, like, does this. So, it's the body's natural response to try to get it to do right. what it wants. Give TSH it a more. is trying, the TSH is beating your thyroid into submission and trying to make it make more. Yeah. So it goes up as your thyroid hormone does not, res- or well, thyroid doesn't respond. As you said earlier, it's like stepping on the gas. Give right. it more gas and maybe it'll run better. Right. And then the next thing that I get response from my, I mean, my patients will go, well, I'm doing what my primary care said. I mean, I guess they got scared to death. Mm-hmm. Well, then they feel terrible and they come back to me. I feel terrible. Yeah. I have all my symptoms back. Well, we need to go back to the thyroid that you were taking. Okay, so the thyroid, if, if what you've instructed me about taking thyroid medicine, yes. whether or not it's a standard mm-hmm. of care or not for old men. It's my standard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what you've instructed me is that I need to take that first thing in the morning before mm-hmm. I consume anything else, even other medicines that I take. And not with coffee. It has to be with water. <clears throat> and I need to wait 20 minutes mm-hmm. before I then take anything else. Right. Other medicines I might take uh, mm-hmm. or even foods other, that I might ingest or what yeah, have you. Even iodine, which helps your thyroid, should be taken later. So that's that's another thing is that it takes a lot of training to train somebody to take their thyroid properly. And if they take it with food, that decreases their dose. So to get the proper dose every single day, you have to take it alone and wait 20 minutes before you consume anything but water. Right. That's hard for some people. So what we tell people is change what I did with my mother-in-law when she went on it at the age of 85, and I wasn't the one that put her on it, is um, change your your routine in the morning. Get up, take your thyroid, drink a glass of water, and then run the bath, take your bath, you know, do all your toiletry things, and then you can eat or drink coffee. And that, that was easier for her than saying, take this and then come into the kitchen and wait 20 minutes while we're all drinking coffee. So if you just, and if you... 
take it and then start drinking coffee, what happens is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work as well. Right. It, it destroys so you some You don't get of the it. full benefit of it. Right. You don't get the full benefit. I mean, if you're on a low dose and you drink coffee, it might you destroy You could lose it. it all, yeah. So, so that's all thyroid medicine except one requires that you do it on an empty stomach and wait 20, 20 minutes is the shortest time you can wait to take it. If you need to take something else sooner or, or next, like some other medication, you can chew up your thyroid medicine, believe it or not, and drink a big glass of water, and that will get into your system faster so that maybe 10 minutes before you have your coffee. But ta okay. chewing it up is icky, and it, it really doesn't taste very good. Mm. But um, but this is, thyroid is very important. I want, you, I want you to remember this one thing. When your doctor looks at your lab and pretend he actually gets all three things, the TSH, the T3, and the T4, and he says, well, your TSH is down so low because you're on thyroid, but your T3 and T4 are perfect, so who cares? Your TSH was stimulating your thyroid to make thyroid. And so it should automatically dial back. So it dial, it does if dial back. Two, and, three, and four are normal. Right. Then, then TSH should drop off. Right. And your T3 okay. and T4 are perfect. Your symptoms are gone. There's nothing to adjust. Okay. I mean, you should have a low TSH if you have the right amount of thyroid. It's they they the have same. a pill for that when there's nothing to adjust. It's called placebo. Yeah. Yeah, well, we don't use those in my office. Well, I know that, but some mainstream medicine does. Right, but, God, I don't know anybody. I Thank goodness. But, thank goodness. But, you but, that, but last thing is, all the other hormones that I use, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, when we give enough, their stimulatory hormones from their pituitary to that organ or to that gland drop down. So why would you not think... It would, it would thyroid seem to be would logical. do the same thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't even make sense physiologically. It's just how doctors are taught. Yeah. But you have to ask questions when you're a doctor. Why does that make sense and why doesn't it make sense? And you should go by what a patient says about their symptoms. Well, but we come back then to the conversation about treating people's symptoms instead of their lab results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and mean, you have to talk to somebody and get their symptoms and actually understand what their life is like to Well, so to now, that, them. now that we have you concerned about thyroids and where yours might be in the process for your health and life, come back next week and we will have a discussion about the way that Dr. Maupin treats thyroids, what she does, why she does it, how she does it, and how that affects you. So if you get a chance... Come back and listen to us next week. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.